The, um, this panel is entitled Recovering a Hidden Collection Through Research and Teaching, the Ottoman Turkish Manuscripts at Yale's Beneki Rare Book and Manuscript Library. So we have a lot of interesting speakers uh, to get to, a lot of interesting material, and Robin, you're going to be uh, lead us off, correct? Yes, that's correct. Thanks, Justin. All right, and so are you. Alrighty, thanks so much. Um, before I begin, I, I want to welcome everybody who is new to Mela. There are many new names uh, who have signed up for this, and um, you guys are welcome, and I'm so glad that you are joining us uh, in this session, and hopefully additional ones as the week goes on. And also, I, I want to thank our very generous sponsors, our uh, vendors who are sponsoring the meeting. Um, uh, honestly, we, we couldn't do what we do without you guys and gals. We need you all, and i um, so glad to... Uh, have your support for the for the meeting. What we're presenting this afternoon is a sort of a miniature version of uh, a very innovative program that um, one of our um, uh, that our senior Turkish lecturer uh, came up with um, for us at Yale uh, last a year ago in the fall semester, and then um, in December the um, the Ottoman Turkish reading class concluded with a symposium. And I think, again, they say a little bit more about it, but we can say more about it in the Q&A. So in the symposium, there were 11 students speaking, and um, we have brought two of them here to talk with you today about their engagement with the um, manuscripts that they had access to for the class. And um, so I have entitled my part of the talk, Off the Shelf, uh, A Brief History of Yale's Hidden Collection of Ottoman Turkish Manuscripts. Um, and in the photograph there, you see happy days of us all together as a class in the Beinecke looking and handling, looking at and handling beautiful manuscripts. Um, oh, well, those days will come back, I hope. So we, we can hope for the best. Um, so although I've spoken several times in recent years on various and on various occasions on the history of Yale collections of manuscripts from the Islamic world, this is the first time that I've ever brought any of my research on this topic to the Mela audience. In my previous presentations, I focused on the Arabic language component of Yale's manuscript collections, which certainly makes up the largest proportion. But today, I'll focus on the Ottoman Turkish items that have come to Yale since 1870, numbering nearly 600. And I know none of you have heard about them before today. They were not added as the result of conscious collection development plan by our predecessors among the faculty and library staff at Yale. Rather, the collection developed opportunistically over the years as a part of other large um, purchases and through many gifts. And I was once in my headset, which I've lost. Ah, the cat is sitting on it. Um, okay. Oh God, never mind. The cat is sitting on my headset. Due to the lack of language expertise among library staff, the collection remains minimally, poorly, and even undescribed. Although students and other experts, such as my dear colleague, Dr. Özgen Felek, from whom you will hear in a few more minutes, have volunteered to correct this. Um, but their offer has not been taken up. Uh, such a collection is by its very nature hard to access. It requires a great deal of work and dedication from librarians and researchers to unlock its secrets and to expose it to the daylight. This is the very definition of a hidden collection. Now, I'm always interested in, in finding out what uh, Yale students could have known about um, the, the non-Western world. And so um, I had a look at the um, the first published catalog of the, of the Yale College Library, which was published in 1743. And it indicates that even at such an early date, Yale students had access to basic bibliographic information about non-Western languages and non-Western liter literary culture. So in the catalog, um, the title page on the left-hand side of your screen, it lists a 1706 title, Introduccio ad Linguas Orientales. So that book was in the, um, uh, the, the Yale College Library's uh, collections um, in 1743. And so then I went to good old um, Hathi Trust, whoopsie, oh, there we go, uh, to get a, a facsimile of the title page of that book and to explore its contents a little bit. Um, so this book um, gives a brief bibliography of grammars, dictionaries, and even some biblical works in the Turkish language, uh, among others. While in the early 18th century, only Yale seniors had access to the library, it is worthwhile to notice that through this one book, students had access to this basic information about works in Turkish, although the language would not be formally taught at Yale until the 20th century. Now, the person that we have to thank, whoops, uh, the person that we have mostly to thank for sowing the seed of Yale library collections in Middle Eastern languages is my pal, Edward Elbridge Salisbury, 
who in 1841 was appointed the first university professor of Arabic and Sanskrit in the Americas, and that was here at Yale. To develop his expertise in these languages, Salisbury made several extended visits to Europe in the first half of the 19th century to study with the famous Orientalists of France and Germany, as these languages were not yet taught in the United States. During these trips, he also established relationships with European book dealers, publishers, and printers that enabled him to build what was for its time the largest personal collection of books and manuscripts in the United States related to what was then called Oriental Studies. This collection was kept in his New Haven house, which you see there in the lower left, and he left the doors unlocked so that Yale students and other friends could make use of it. So I found in the archives these various little notes. I went into your house and I borrowed your book. Uh, it's just really astonishing. Uh, it turns out nobody in New Haven left their doors in those days. Um, unfortunately, the house is gone. Um, it was demolished in the mid, to, it was in the 50s, I think, and now it, it was a parking lot for a while, and now it is the home of the uh, county courthouse. Uh, so that uh, lovely home with its garden is no longer there. Salisbury was primarily an Arabist and readily confessed his ignorance of Ottoman Turkish. But when he donated his personal library to Yale in 1870, his collection included a few items in Persian and Turkish, including one that is a former de Sassi item. So Sylvestre de Sassi, his name was brought up in the previous session. And of course, he's the famous French uh, scholar of you know, Oriental languages. And um, this object on the right is the catalog of the um, auction of de Sassi's books um, that took, it held, took place over five years. It took five years because the collection was so enormous to auction off the whole thing. Mm -hmm. We ended up with about 60 manuscripts that had belonged to de Sassi um, that were acquired from various French book dealers. And the arrow is pointing to one of the ones that we got that includes within it, um, the Trophée Shahidi, which you're going to hear a little bit more about um, in this session this afternoon. Um, another item that Salisbury acquired and donated was uh, this one, which is described as a passport from a Pasha. Um, unfortunately, I'm not able to tell what it actually is, but maybe some of our Ottomanists can help us out. And then also this very interesting item, next, come on, uh, whoops, oh, for heaven's sake, uh, which is an almanac, um, and it's a scroll-shaped object. Um, so it rolls out quite long, and it has this very attractive um, uh, uh, headpiece with wonderful uh, military elements uh, that are familiar, I think, to um, those of us who enjoy Turkish uh, soap operas. Um, so, uh, so his donation in 1870 amounted to some 4,500 items that were principally printed works, but also included 103 manuscript volumes. This collection and the Landberg collection, about which I will also say a little more, were reckoned among Yale's treasures in the magisterial 11th edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. So in 1900, thanks to connections between Yale professor of Semitic languages, Charles Cutler Torrey, and the independent Swedish scholar, Count Carlo Landberg, and enabled by the philanthropy of banker and financier, Morris Ketchum Jessup, Yale was able to obtain a collection of 842 manuscripts bringing Yale's total collection to more than 1,000 items. But the Ottoman Turkish component of this was still quite small. Um, and uh, let me see, uh, very, we were beaten. In, in 1900, we had 1,000. And in 1901, Princeton got a great big collection. So um, they beat us so pretty quick. But it's not a, it's not a, a battle. Whoops. Sorry about this. The mouse is very sensitive. Okay. Um, about the Landberg collection. So like the Salisbury collection, it is principally in Arabic with only a few items in Persian or Turkish. The 1956 catalog created by Leon Nimoy lists only three Turkish manuscripts. And I've pointed to two of them in the catalog here. And I've got pictures of them there on the right. So those are the ones that are only described as Turkish in um, Nimoy's catalog. Um, neither Landberg nor Nimoy were able to read Ottoman Turkish, and while Nimoy based his catalog on Landberg's provided at the time of the 1900 purchase, neither of them attempted to provide even basic description. But fortunately, the catalog records for these items, which you can find using the call numbers that are actually visible on the screen, um, somebody did a better job with the actual online catalog records, so they are better filled out. So this slide here is our friend Leon Nimoy. Um, who was, uh, you know, well, his dates are there. He was here a long time, 43 years. Um, and uh, this is his 1956 catalog of the um, 1,466 items that were principally in Arabic that were received between 1870 and 1956. 
And um, then um, these are his original catalog cards, which are kept in a box in the Beinecke. Um, and uh, I love this humble little note that you see here on the right. Um, all information given on these cards must uh, be regarded as tentative and subject to revision by a competent specialist in each field. And then he signs it very humbly, just as LM. Um, and uh, you can, uh, you, I'm not sure if you can see um, that the uh, some catalog cards are handwritten, but then at some point, our friend uh, Leon got a typewriter, and so he was able to type his um, his Ottoman script uh, cataloging uh, information for his cards. All right, so um, in uh, 1949, um, uh, Yale acquired uh, the items that are known as the Welcome Krauss Collection. Um, and many of you probably know this story. Sir Henry S. Welcome was an American pharmaceutical entrepreneur. Among the things that he patented was um, a cure for, or a, a treatment for syphilis, which was very important for soldiers in World War I. And of course, that's a very, very important drug. And um, he made a whole lot of money um, as pharmaceutical entrepreneurs often do. And he was also a collector. Um, he was pr principally interested in the history of medicine. Um, most of his collections went to the Wellcome Trust uh, Library, which is in London, but the non-medical items were deaccessioned and were sold to Yale in 1949 by um, Hans Krauss, who's in the lower right there, um, the very well-known New York bookseller. And um, let me see, I have a few more details. Uh, there's approximately 20 items in Turkish um, that are from the Wellcome Krauss collection that are described only on those cards that you saw in the previous picture. So after the Welcome Krauss 1949 purchase, the collection continued to grow between gifts and purchase, with substantial purchases being made presumably at Leon Nimoy's recommendation, particularly in the years immediately before his retirement, so from 1963 to 1966, um, in all three languages, Arabic, Persian, and Turkish. So approximately 150 items were added um, during this period of time. Let's see, our next important group of materials came from this gentleman, um, Oscar Rescher. So there were many um, uh, European Jews who found refuge in Middle Eastern countries um, upon the rise of the Nazi uh, regime in Germany. And um, Oscar Rescher was one of these. Um, he was a, a scholar of, of Oriental languages and he had a real affinity for Turkey. And um, he was uh, basically defrocked. He was no longer permitted to teach at his university. So he emigrated to Turkey. He took uh, Turkish citizenship. He became a Muslim and um, worked uh, in, in various capacities as a, as a librarian and, um, uh, and as a scholar and a, an, an instructor um, and uh, died in Turkey. Um, and I have the photograph on the left uh, because he is said to have lived in a house that was on the Bosphorus that he shared with many cats. And of course, the cats of Turkey are famous, uh, thanks to a, a documentary that you've probably most of you seen, especially if you like cats, like I do. Um, but in any case, so um, we had been acquiring stuff from Oscar Rescher um, in small quantities um, uh, from the late 60s. Uh, but um, after his death in 1972, um, we purchased a, the, what is called the Rescher Collection. Um, let me see, uh, I believe, uh, let's see, the, the Russia purchase included 82 items in Turkish, um, which are cataloged in the Turkish manuscript supplement sequence, and they were described in a 1972 article authored by Leon Nimoy. So I blatantly stole these beautiful images from Özgen Felek's uh, Twitter account. Um, Özgen will tell you the story of uh, her engagement with this collection, um, and she, thank heavens, uh, tweeted uh, voluminously about what she was finding in the collection. Um, and uh, because the photographs were so lovely, um, I just I just went ahead and stole them, but I have credited her, her as you can see on the slide. Um, so uh, after 1972, um, acquisitions information for Turkish items in the collection is less available. However, acquisitions have continued. And the most notable large purchase was the 2005 acquisition of some 1200 items from the Hartford Seminary Manuscript Collection. This group includes, well, uh, an, I say an unknown number of Turkish items that were not described in its hand list, but Özgen has figured this all out and she will tell you about it. Now, um, in our collections, of course, not all Ottoman objects, whoops, are manuscripts. Um, whoops, we have, I'm sorry, not all Ottoman objects are in Ottoman Turkey. So we have things that are obviously Ottoman objects that are actually in Arabic. So, well, this object on the right is this very beautiful um, 
it's a gift book for a student and the Arabic that's in it is not much. It's really mostly these kinds of uh, pious phrases that you see in the top uh, right here. And then of course on the left is the very famous Dala'il al-Khayrat, which is uh, a, a, basically a prayer book, an extremely popular uh, work, which is written in Arabic, but in the margins there's commentary here in Ottoman Turkish. But this is, um, you know, the, the text itself is Arabic, but um, it is clearly an Ottoman object and it has Ottoman Turkish uh, annotations. And so not only are, is it true that not all Ottoman objects are in Ottoman Turkish, not all Ottoman objects are manuscripts that are in our collection. So um, recently I acquired these wonderful um, historic periodicals. Uh, I'm, uh, some of you may know, I'm a, I'm a total fool for late 19th and early 20th century periodicals from um, Middle Eastern countries. They're fascinating. The artwork is incredible. Um, they're amazing records of their time. Um, so I got these uh, recently and added them to the collection. So um, now we just heard this morning about um, the uh, manuscripts of the modern world, Muslim world manuscript project uh, at Penn. Um, uh, you know, I, I said that our collection is not cataloged and um, I am hoping to emulate this project um, for Yale, um, involve Kelly and Emma, um, you know, to uh, maybe advise us on how to do something like it for Yale. So we will see how that goes. Um, and then the other thing that I thought was interesting is I'm about to wrap up. Um, when I was working on this whole thing with Özgen a year ago um, and learning about Oscar Rescher and um, uh, his contributions to uh, scholarship and to our collections, I happened to get an email from a researcher like the day before our symposium. So our symposium was on the 11th of December and I got this email the day before from some Turkish scholars who were um, trying to learn more about Oscar Rescher's life. And um, so I just, like to know that you know people are still interested in these uh, stories, in these people, um, in these figures who um, have sort of helped move this stuff around and helped to make us all uh, aware of, of these kinds of materials. And I'm also in touch with Oscar Rescher's great nephew. He is a, a professor of philosophy at um, University of Pittsburgh, and um, he has actually donated some uh, interesting uh, books from his own personal collection uh, on Islamic philosophy to Yale. So, uh, you know, it's just nice. These uh, connections uh, persist down through the years. And I'm gonna stop there.